started. Welcome everybody to the deep dive into the Oculus Rift SDK. Um, hope you brought your scuba gear. Um, I'm Dean, a graphics engineer at Oculus, and then with me today is Laura McQuaid and Volga Aksoy to talk about pieces we've added to the Rift SDK over the years. There's a quick agenda of, uh, of all the things we'll be covering, quite a bit, life cycle, layer updates, six off, input emulation. Okay, so, Quick brief, brief intro into the SDK itself. We've, we've uh, learned a lot building a core VR rendering SDK. We've always knew the latency was important and that's always been central to the SDK. Up-to-date pose tracking and prediction has been the core since day one. As it's developed, however, we've added a few tricks to simulate or realize low latency. For latency hiding, we had time warp, followed by async time warp, followed by async space warp. These are all fill-in techniques which warp the color buffer in some way to approximate in-scene movement. We can reliably predict. For latency reduction, we've had phase sync. We haven't posed, uh, talking about phase sync, but today, Lauren, will be going more into depth into that fantastic feature of the SDK. Here's a picture of async time warp in operation. To enable Dash and better control focus with the app, we've added a couple new states, along with a flag that lets Dash know that the app is in focus and aware of these flags. So here we're talking about life cycle. We have two life cycle states. If we didn't do this, we wouldn't have a way to transfer input focus between Dash and the active app. Items being held by the user will be dropped or lost, and your interaction with the game would overload Dash's interaction. So the thing to understand here is, is we now can take over with Dash, as we announced it early, uh, yesterday. We can now take, take control of that state, and we now have two flags to know, let the app know what's, what's going on with Dash. When has input focus is true, Games that can pause your simulation should. So if you have a, a single player game, it's a good idea now that you know Dash is up. If you don't have input focus, to, to pause the rendering. Keep, keep showing the rendering, but pause the world in simulations and physics. This doesn't mean pause rendering, as the world will continue to be cross-composited. For, mul uh, for multiplayer games, it just means stop drawing the hands, and maybe even uh, ex accept the input from controllers in some manner that's meaningful for the multiplayer game, of course. If they're still holding a gun, we'll need to have some sort of management of that. Software may also want to, uh, to want to update the player's avatar to show that the other players are the users in Dash. So if you can imagine, in that has input focused site that loses focus, you know, have some sort of avatar today to show that the user no longer has input focus. Um, also, we have overlay present. This is to inform the Dash is presently visible to the user. This can be via, uh, via pin window or Dash itself. So you can imagine now that Dash will inter interpose within the world, you know, as the person's interacting with whatever windows or whatever UI, that they can actually, that the game knows that they have the overlay up. Um, and this, this informs the Apple actual app. Um, in this case, you know, the, they could also have a pinned window, so if they look behind them, it could be there or it could be anywhere in the world. Um, when, it ha as it, when has input focus is false, you generally assume the overlay present is true. Though if a pin window is present, you can expect has input focus to be true, but overlay present also be true. Or in other words, pretty much they're, they're somewhat exclusive but inclusive of each other. The other thing that we've, we've added fairly significantly to the SDK is depth support. This is, is why depth? The more information we can get about the scene, the better. When it comes to latency in VR, ideally the whole scene graph, animation paths, player movement, and everything else, we'd want that in the compositor. We'd want all of it. In a sense, this would, th this would make the compositor itself an engine, though. This isn't really practical, and we have engines for to do, to do engine -y sort of things. Instead, we look to the buffers which provide the most information for the lowest cost. Color buffers today, in, rendered in the FOV of the headset, are absolutely necessary. This is what we've done since day one, always take the color buffers. To further aid in rendering at a low cost, we're asking for depth. What we have now is, I, or what's coming to soon is the IOFV depth. With Dash, it will allow us to constructively blend the Dash environment with the game environment. This is meaningful because it maintains immersion and interactivity while allowing users to better control their VR environment. For Dash specifically, we won't use depth. Uh, we will also use depth instead of ASW to properly position Dash in the world with the lowest amount of latency. This doesn't affect developers, but you should know that ASW is always available to the app even when Dash is visible. Uh, going into more detail onto this, if you can think about having two games rendering at the same time, one will, with that much uh, demands on the GPU, that game will probably get ASW depending on where it's at, and then Dash will, will use the depth to place itself properly in the world. The, the, the consequence then will be a nicely composited low latency world. What this ends up looking like is what you can see here. You can actually see, if you look at the side of the, of the, of the, the shelf, there's actually a, a gray outline while Dash is, is interposing with the world. 
does DEP use extra resources? Under, under the extremely likely case, you're already using a debt buffer. Sharing with us requires little, low, little to no extra overhead. In many cases, there is no extra overhead. But with MSA enabled, there can be a very small cost. This is in terms of tens of microseconds of overhead to do the resolve, even on the slowest hardware. The important thing to know is that you do not have to resolve or manipulate depth in any way beyond having solid objects properly represented in the depth buffer matching the submitted view projection matrix. This is a side-by-side -side screenshot showing that yes, the one that's using depth does have a tiny bit extra cost, but it's marginal to the app. What about quads and cylinders? Since depth is intrinsic to these objects, these, the, it is actually calculated automatically. Alpha values of less than 50% are tested against depth, but not written to depth. You can now have hands and touch controllers composited over multiple solid quads or cylinder layers that we have in the SDK. So this is a shot here. This is a dash, and then the hand is rendered in the FOV layer. So this is actual cr uh, cross cross FOV quad layer composition being done by the compositor. What about for, for uh, transparency? Well, here's an example of what happens in the event that you, the depth isn't written to the, uh, to the depth buffer. Most engines don't write depth pixels less than 50% alpha. This is arbitrary, actually. So you know, in, in this case, the, the actual whirlpool effect itself, the blue area, isn't written to depth at all. And you can see that in the very center area. Um, this is what transistency will look like. It's nothing to be too concerned about, but simply be aware of it, that this can happen within, uh, with, with depth compositing. Another ex example where, where depth can be, a little, can be a little odd, just that you need to be, be mindful of it, is if it happened to write depth to the, uh, uh, when you're writing something transparent. So an example here, the wrists are, are written to depth, but they're not actually writing any pixels. So in this case, it ends up make, punching a hole through the quad layer. This little example quad we have in o Oculus World demo shows this sort of, uh, this, uh, this sort of effect. Now to talk about face sync, here's Laura McQuaid. Hi, um, my name is Lauren McQuaid. Um, I work in the engine integrations team at Oculus, and I'm here to talk about a cool feature called FaceSync um, and what that means for frame timing and imp implications to single threaded and multi threaded renderers. So, I've worked at Oculus since about a year before Rift launch, and during that time, I spent a great deal of time in GPU view looking at uh, the uh, CPU and GPU and compositor and how they interacted and, and you know, how frames were scheduled and asking how we could do it better. And from that, uh, FaceSync was born. Um, so one of the really cool things about FaceSync is that it acts to minimize positional latency. Um, it does that by scheduling the start of the CPU for each frame so that the GPU finishes just before composite. And it does this adaptively so that um, each application is given just the amount of positional latency it needs. Um, it's been in our system since we introduced ATW, and it works in complement with ATW. Uh, ATW works to keep rotational latency low, and FaceSync works to keep positional latency low. And it also, um, ATW also covers for it. In the case where FaceSync mispredicts the, how long a frame will take and we miss a composite, then ATW will end up time warping the last frame. It's also fully automatic and always enabled. Uh, there's nothing you need to do to enable it, um, and you've been using it all this time. So here's a graph of what a typical frame looks like, going from the CPU to the GPU to the compositor, and then um, we have something by vSync, we scan it out, and then at some point you see it. So if we start at the bottom left, the uh, previous frame has called OVR submit frame. Um, OVR submit frame blocks until FaceSync decides that it's time for the CPU to start on the next frame. At the start of the, that frame, the CPU samples the HMD's pose and then issues draw calls to render the eye buffers. The GPU then consumes those draw calls and renders the eye buffers and finishes before the composite. And then the compositor samples the HMD's orientation again and then applies time warp and distortion. And then at vSync, we start scanning out the image. And at some point later, it's visible to the user. So if you're looking at rotational latency, that's measured from when uh, the compositor sampled the HMD's orientation uh, to when it's visible to the user. And if you're looking at positional latency, that's that top 
blue line, which goes from when the CPU um, sampled the positional latency to when it's visible to the user. So what FaceSync tries to do is start the CPU as late as possible in order that, so that the uh, GPU can finish before that composite. Now you notice there's a gap there, and that gap is intentional because uh, um, not every frame takes the same amount of time. And so um, depending on the variance in frame times, uh, FaceSync calculates a um, ideal gap to leave between, between there. And it looks at the measured time the, um, from an actual frame, compares it to that ideal time, and then alters the phase of when the CPU starts its frame relative to the heartbeat of the composites accordingly, which is why it's called FaceSync. So FaceSync will adapt as your uh, app with, for apps that have different workloads. So for an app with heavy workload, um, we can actually start the CPU rendering a frame um, up to uh, two frame intervals before the composite that we're targeting. Um, and we can do this while maintaining full frame rate as long as the CPU and GPU individually um, complete in less than a frame interval. And um, we've done a lot of work to make sure that this can be fully pipelined, that right after the CPU or GPU are done with a frame, we can start on the next frame immediately. Uh, conversely, if your app has a very light workload, we don't want to penalize you by having greater um, positional latency than is required. So FaceSync will actually wait until the very last moment to kick off your frame so that it will finish right before composite and give you the best positional latency. In this, in this example here, it's you know, less than a frame interval. So um, another thing that, that uh, you notice looking at uh, multi-threaded renders in GPU view is that submit frame is not always the best place for FaceSync to, um, to block. Um, so we are, for multi-threaded renders, we're, we're, we're deprecating submit frame and we're splitting it up into these three functions. OVR wait to begin frame, OVR begin frame, and OVR end frame. OVR wait frame is uh, what, um, what, will, what FaceSync will block until it's time for the CPU to start rendering the frame. Now this can be called from any thread, specifically a different thread from begin frame and end frame. OVR begin frame is called uh, before any, executing any GPU commands related to this frame, and it needs to be called from the same thread which is executing the command queue. And similarly, OVR end frame is called after executing all the GPU commands related to the frame, and it also needs to be called from the thread which is executing the command queue. So if we go back to our single-threaded case here with submit frame, you can see the, the CPU renders a frame, calls OVR submit frame, that blocks until FaceSync decides it's time to render the next frame, and then the next frame gets rendered. Um, the multi-threaded case is a little bit uh, more complex. You probably have a render thread down the bottom, which is calling OVR wait to begin frame to know when to kick off. It then uh, generates command lists, probably in some multi-threaded fashion, and then there's probably another thread which is consuming those command lists and, and executing them. And that's the thread that needs to call OVR begin frame and OVR end frame. So if you are doing multi-threaded rendering, you're probably using DX12 or Vulkan. Um, we've had uh, DX12 support um, for the last year, and this year we've introduced Vulkan support. Um, these are um, pretty similar to what you know for DX11, but there are some slight and important differences. For um, DX12, um, the functions that you use are still in the OVR CAPI D3D.h header. Um, then the main difference is that when you call uh, create texture swap chain DX, you need to pass a ID312 command queue object where you would have passed an ID311 device for the D3D pointer. And it's important to note that this is the command queue that um, we expect to be used when you render the I buffers. <laughs> 
For Vulkan, uh, all the functions in there are included in the OVR capy vk.h, and it's a little bit more involved. First off, you need to call OVR get instance extensions vk and OVR get device extensions vk to enumerate the, ext the extensions that we expect um, when you are creating your vk instance and vk device. Then, uh, before you call OVR begin frame the first time, you need to call OVR set synchronization queue vk. Uh, this will set uh, the queue which is used for rendering the I buffers. You have to call that before the first time you call um, begin frame, and you, if it never changes, you never have to call it again. If it, if it does change, you can get, call us with a different queue every frame, um, but it has to be called at least once. And then there are um, functions for creating swap chains and getting their buffers that are similar to the D3D ones, but take VK devices and return a VK image. So if you're doing multi-GPU rendering, um, that's pretty much all needs to be handled by your app. Your app is going to be responsible for getting these textures from the secondary GPU onto the GPU um, where your HMD is connected. Um, and your app is responsible for syncing and fencing this all down by the time you call end frame. Um, if you have any questions about phase sync, frame timing, um, or um, the uh, new uh, D3, DX12 and Vulkan stuff, um, there's a Q&A afterwards, and, uh, or I'll be here afterwards. And uh, here to talk about new layer types is Volga Axe. All right, thank you. Um, so the name is Volga, and along with uh, Lauren and Dean, I've been working at Oculus for about four years now. Uh, prior to working at Oculus, um, I was at Electronic Arts uh, working as a graphics engineer for about a decade or so, and I shipped about a dozen games when I was over there. And some of you that might have attended uh, Oculus Connect 1, the very first one, uh, might remember me from uh, giving the PC SDK talk along with Mike Antonoff, um, where we were talking about the new hotness at the time. That was the DK2 headset. Um, so, all right, without further ado, let's get into some of the new layer types we're adding. So first up, uh, we are just now releasing the QMAP layer types, and very soon we'll end up releasing the uh, cylinder layer types that Dean briefly alluded to as well. QMAPs, well, I'm guessing a lot of you have uh, used QMAPs in one form or another in your real-time graphics application. And they're basically a GPU acceleration structure built out of six square textures and uh, usually used for environment mapping uh, purposes. In our case, we're using these as uh, a form of a layer that is always projected to infinity that covers all around the user. The idea here is that they're always projected to infinity because we're expecting them to be uh, rendering uh, background elements that could be even further than your uh, regular up, up close elements. Um, and in this case, if you provide MIP maps with your, with your cube map, as well as also providing uh, the high quality layer flag, then you'll get even better uh, alias-free visuals. The, the way we're utilizing these cube maps actually lends itself to uh, having perfect asynchronous time warp application. Again, this is mainly because they are projected to infinity, so there's no translation component to worry about. And when you think about the way asynchronous time warp works, it's meant to correct for orientation latency. So naturally, it ends up having uh, no issues when you put on the headset, even if your application were to accidentally drop frames, you'll see the cube map perfectly move in your view. And because it contains full 360 knowledge of the, uh, the environment, it ends up having no black pull in artifacts that you would have seen maybe for, with a regular IFOV layer type. I'm guessing a lot of you by now know that we always ship our Oculus World demo since we've been doing that since day one. Um, and uh, in the latest version of it, you'll be able to run it, hit tab, go into the layers cube map section and see how we're 
making use of and demonstrating our use of CubeMap layers in uh, the Oculus World demo app. The uh, two use cases that we're basically showing is how you can use them both for dynamic and static usage. And the static use case is basically loading the texture off the hard drive, whereas the dynamic use case is when you flip to it, it'll quickly take a capture of the 360 environment around the camera, feed it in as a cube map so you can keep looking around it. If we were to quickly look at the data structure that you would pass in, the one element that is basically uh, the new one here is the orientation. And again, because there's no translation component, the quaternion orientation is all you end up worrying about. Next up is the cylinder layers. So an easy analogy for the cylinder layers is the, um, you can think of it as a virtual curved TV uh, in front of you. There's some good use cases like heads up displays, graphical user elements, uh, head locked visors. And compared to, uh, say, a quad layer that we have always shipped with, the nicety of the cylinder layers is that it basically has perfect texture to display pixel ratio. If you think about the problem with a quad layer, the larger you make it or the closer you bring it to the user, the periphery ends up starting to scrunch up. And if you especially had text on there, it would be particularly illegible. So the cool part about the cylinder layer is that it's relatively equidistant to the user and always perpendicular as well to their viewpoint. So you get a better view there. And just like the cube map layers, the cylinder layers end up having perfect positional asynchronous time warp as well. Just like the quad layers have positional asynchronous time warp, if the application were to drop frames, they'll still keep moving in the user's uh, HMD perfectly smoothly. To that end, I should point out that neither cube maps uh, nor cylinders, much like the quad layers, don't get asynchronous space warp applied to them because time warp does a perfect job of moving them around in the user space. And soon when we ship the cylinder layers, you'll be able to again see a sample use case, simply run it, navigate to the cylinder option, and you'll see how we have parameterized our uh, cylinder layers. And you can fiddle with the options to see how it affects the, the look of the layer itself. And a quick look at the data structure. Uh, the one I wanted to point out is our aspect ratio. So it might uh, look strange that we don't have a height option and instead we have an aspect ratio. The rationale behind that is because cylinders uh, basically utilize a two-dimensional texture, there's a good chance that the content creator is expecting their texture to be shown to the user with a particular aspect ratio. So the thing we wanted to lock down is that aspect ratio by the developer. And then from the aspect ratio and the angle of that cylinder, we end up calculating a height with some simple math behind the scenes. Next up, we'll talk about our Oculus Mirror tool. So I'm sure a lot of you have used the Oculus Debug tool, and our Oculus Mirror tool has been shipping for the past few versions in our SDK. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, with our runtime, and it resides right next to the uh, Oculus Debug tool. We've been adding more and more options over time as we see fit, and more recently, we've added quite a bit of command line arguments that allow you to customize the look of the, the Mirror tool and the way it presents things. If you're curious about those options, you can now simply hit F1 and you'll get a pop-up like the one on the right-hand side, which further describes in detail all the options. I did want to point out a couple more recent features that we're adding to the tool, though. One of them is the ability to take screenshots, regardless of what the VR application might or might not support. You'll now be able to use the mirror tool to quickly snap a screenshot and save it on your hard drive and you'll be able to keep using all the customization options the tool provides you. The other cool feature that we've provided, and this is more of a um, developer-focused feature, is the ability to see what the compositor is doing behind the scenes from what we're calling a third-person point of view. And in this case, the third person is really your touch controllers based on which one you decide to pick. You can basically keep using your touch controller as an external camera from what the compositor is doing. So the application would keep rendering from the head-mounted displaced position. And if your application is particularly making heavy use of layers, 
it becomes an even more convenient feature. So you can keep moving your touch controller around you and you can see how those layers are moving in your parallax. Or maybe you have a particular layer that you've kind of lost track of. Maybe your math didn't quite work out. You can quickly rotate your touch controller to see if it was perhaps behind you or to the side. And along with the options that we've provided in the Oculus Mirror tool, we are now uh, soon going to be releasing these options uh, as part of our regular mirror creation uh, SDK call. Keep in mind that with these options, once you start using them, depending on the options you're providing, there's a, a, it will actually kick off a separate custom uh, composition pass based on those options. Why are we providing this? Well, it's relatively obvious, but um, basically it's an undistorted view where based on the options you're providing, it's going to be natively compositing based on the resolution you're requesting. So you're no longer bound by the back buffer resolution of what the HMD is bound to. Also, it won't have any chromatic aberration correction artifacts that you normally see in the traditional mirror windows. And if your application is making heavy use of all the different layer types, then you'll be able to see the composited results sent back to your application along with the optional system layers injected on top of it, say like Guardian or some of the notifications that might be popping up. And again, just like I was pointing out, because this is kicking off a separate composition pass, it doesn't come for free. However, in an average use case, we've come to see that it takes about 0.1 milliseconds. A quick look at some of the enumerated options that we're providing, and I'll briefly illustrate visually what these kind of look like. Here's a shot we've pulled from our uh, Quill application, uh, showing one of the sample scenes that come with it. And if you were to use the left eye only option, you'll see a rectilinear output. And comparatively, this is what a right eye would look like. And if I were to go back and forth, you'll see there's a bit of parallax difference from picking out the two different eyes. And if we were to use the include guardian option, now because in this case we're also not using the left eye or the right eye only, the result you get back actually contains both the left and the right eye simultaneously split half and half. But also you realize there's the uh, guardian lines visible there as well. And this is what we're calling our post distortion, which was our classic mirror that you could have requested. Again, you realize it has the distortion built into it. It has that chromatic aberration correction. You might call it artifacts. Um, definitely not wanted if you're presenting this image on the desktop. So even though this image is practically free to request, it's not really presentation friendly. So this is the main reason why we're really introducing all these new other options. Next up, I'll talk about a couple convenience features that we're adding to our texture swap chain creation. First up is the, uh, is the fact that now we're allowing the application to create uh, MSA color textures directly in the texture swap chain, be it 2x, 4x, 8x. Previously, we requested the application to do the resolve before it sent it. Now we'll make sure that we handle all the intricacies behind the scenes and sample it appropriately when the time comes up. The other option we're providing is the auto generate MIPS flag. This is something that we've been thinking about for a while, but uh, the idea is basically instead of the application having to create the MIPS, now you can just set this flag and it will take care of the intricacies again behind the scenes. So why are we providing these couple of uh, features? Mainly, we know we have a lot of enthusiasts users that have really beefy GPUs. And over time, we've seen that a lot of them like to make uh, use of all the cycles their GPU provides. So they love to open up the Oculus debug tool, crank the pixel density to 1.5, sometimes 2.0 or above. The problem, however, is that once you start rendering such gigantic textures, when they get sent over to the compositor, they end up getting sparsely sampled. And that ends up introducing what you might think of as temporal aliasing. The funny part here is that the user is normally cranking the pixel density to get more crisp visuals. However, there's the downside of accidentally introducing aliasing. So what we're looking at is eventually making use of these flags that we're providing behind the scenes tied to heuristics that we can drive 
as well as letting the user drive these so that if we notice there is a good chance we would benefit from such flags, we can flip them on or let the user flip them on, as well as potentially modifying the MIP bias so you can balance the crispness of the high pixel density along with the anti-aliasing benefits of MIP mapping. We know that we don't want to just blindly create all the MIPs because that eventually has the side effect of sometimes blurring the image and making the text less legible than it would have been otherwise. The upshot here is that once we get this going, it will actually benefit not only the future applications, but all the applications that have shipped until now. And all the, the users will see the benefits uh, across the board. Next up, we'll talk about the six degrees of freedom iPoses. So this was introduced with our SDK version 117. And in a nutshell, what we've done here is change the three-dimensional three vector that we had that was only defining the IPD and the eye relief as an offset from the center of the HMD to also include a rotational component, which bumped it up to six degrees of freedom. And just to illustrate what this could end up looking like, here's a view of a, the, the old style where we basically have two cameras where each camera represents your eye pose. And you'll notice instantly that the projection planes on both cameras are parallel to each other. And also the projection center axes on both cameras are parallel to the HMD's facing direction. Compare that to say our six degrees of freedom method where now this is just one of the possible options. The cameras could be rotated away from each other. And you, again, you'll instantly recognize that the center axis lines are no longer parallel to the HMD facing direction, nor are the projection planes parallel to each other. So I should quickly point out that we aren't currently actively making use of this extra three degrees of freedom that we've added. This is more of a future facing update because we wanted to roll this out as soon as possible when we do eventually make use of it so that applications shipping today are already backwards compatible and we'll just start working with these features that we're releasing. The benefits here are that it gives us the freedom to define our HMD geometry with better degrees of freedom as well as being better aligned with OpenXR which is the initiative we're also part of and we're pushing for these extra degrees of freedom. When we do eventually make use of this, this will also allow your application to make better use of the resolution distribution across the eye textures that your application is submitting to us. There were some rumors about the reasoning behind why we submitted this when we initially did release this. And some people thought that it was perhaps for eye tracking or foveated rendering reasons. And I just wanted to point out that that wasn't really the purpose. And for applications that have shipped prior to 117, I, I will talk about how we deal with the backwards compatibility aspect of uh, how we make sure these applications don't end up breaking. So some of the considerations. Well, I did point out how that uh, with six degrees of freedom, you no longer can assume that the two cameras are facing parallel to each other. This means that when we do start making use of the orientation, some of the visual rendering tricks you might be pulling off could potentially end up uh, looking wrong in your application. For example, if you were rendering billboarded particles, say you were rendering large smoke quads in your view and you rendered them in such a way that it was trying to remain parallel to the, uh, the projection plane. Well, if you think about it, the projection plane is now different for each eye, so that quad would actually have a different orientation for each eye. Naturally, when you wear the headset and look at the scene, that was caused some stereo fusion problems for the users. Similarly, if uh, you explicitly tried to render uh, user-facing quads like headlocked UIs or splash screens, this would have a similar problem like the billboard particles we're talking about. The recommendation I would give for these specific quads is that you should just actually go ahead and use our quad layer type, which handles the intricacies behind the scenes and also has the added benefit of having perfect asynchronous time warp. And you'll eventually, you'll real soon be able to start making use of the cylinder layers as well. If your application had maybe some kind of post effects where it was relying explicitly on the depth buffer values that it was writing into the depth buffer, um, 
if you think about it, the depth buffer values increase uh, in line with the center axis of the projection. So the further you get away, the values increase as a plane. If you think about it, those two planes are now potentially different for each eye, which means for a given corresponding section in the two eyes, the post effect you're applying to that element on the screen could actually have a slightly different looking post effect result. And just like the other cases, that's again going to cause some stereo fusion problems. So again, um, the, 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 the way, the easy way to work around this is to avoid using the depth value as is and simply calculate a distance from where your camera is at to the position on, of that element. That way you end up and you end up calculating what would be a spherical surface and it ends up being um, more in line with the uh, stereo fusion that we're striving for. Similarly, if you were trying to create monoscopic rendering frustums or frustums for culling purposes, I'll go into detail in a little bit on how we handled those cases. For illustration purposes, consider this. Here's a billboarded quad. The quads look uh, the same in both eye views. Maybe there's just a little bit of stereo parallax to account for the offset of the cameras. Com comparing that to our six degrees of freedom method, you'll notice that the six degrees of freedom has a perspective correction on it. And this would naturally come out of the uh, rendering equations that you would be using once you start making use of the orientation. It might look weird at first, but once you do submit those, when you wear the headset, then you would realize that the uh, image actually looks correct in the headset. So how do we deal with backwards compatibility? Well, essentially because the application doesn't know how to handle six degrees of freedom, we end up converting what would have been our six degrees of freedom down to a three degrees of freedom camera setup. The way we do this is by simply rotating the center projection axes to be parallel to each other and then line up the frustum boundaries. And in this case, you'll notice that the, um, the right side uh, and the left sides of the extents end up getting extended to make sure the projection planes are flush with one another and they're parallel. Another thing you'll notice is that what would have effectively been the same amount of field of view for the six degrees of freedom and three degrees of freedom, the three degrees of freedom frame buffer would physically cover a larger area. This means that for the same resolution texture you would have used for your six and three degrees of freedom eye textures, effectively you'll get less pixels per degree because the distribution isn't as nice as the six degrees of freedom method. So to get the same pixels per degree for the three degrees of freedom method, you would have eventually had to render a higher resolution. And obviously resolution is something, high resolution is something uh, we're trying to avoid to make the best use of our GPU time. Now, this conversion that I've just pointed out, there are some use cases for your own application, uh, but I do want to point out that we are providing a helper function that takes care of this for you. Essentially, you provide in what we're calling an FOV port. An FOV port is how we define our camera frustums, along with a quaternion that defines the amount of rotation which is provided to you by the SDK. And out comes a new frustum that has the rotation removed out of it. The use cases for these are again, like I was pointing out earlier, monoscopic rendering, frustum culling, and other use cases where you're essentially trying to create what we might call a union frustum. In this case, the union frustum is a single frustum that is covering both the left and the right eye camera frustums in a single frustum. And you, you end up using this uh, for also cases where you might have your application fall back to a three degrees of freedom method. Again, we wouldn't recommend that you do this, but we can understand if you need to use it temporarily. So I would recommend that you use the function I just provided above. And another thing I should point out is that when you're creating your union frustums, eventually you want to feed it into our helper function max, which effectively takes the leftmost, rightmost, upmost, and downmost extents of both cameras and provides a union of the two frustums. However, obviously, you want to do this only once you've first uh, 
make sure the two frustums are pointing in the same direction because otherwise the math wouldn't make sense. Next up, I'll talk about input emulation. And essentially, uh, input emulation was introduced in our runtime for applications that were originally coded up to work with the gamepad to start working with our touch controllers as well. Effectively, the input emulation is explicitly enabled or disabled by the developers. So it's not something that just happens automatically. And you, the, you as a developer, elect to have this working for your application at the point you're about to publish it on our Oculus Store. Obviously, you're going to want to test this locally before you publish it. So the way to do that will be through the Windows registry key that I'm going to provide in a second. I should point out, however, that Given the modes that I'm about to show you, if you find out that n neither of the, none of the options work for you, I would recommend that you fall back to using our native touch controller API that we provide in the SDK, which gives you full freedom of how you want to utilize the touch controller. At that point, obviously, you'd be able to make use of the three degrees of freedom motion, or rather the six degrees of freedom motion of the touch controllers as well. A few things I should point out. We do not explicitly forward the haptics from the gamepad calls to the touch controller. And you should also note that the D-pad and the view buttons aren't always mapped, uh, and this is dependent on the mode you might be selecting. Also, the one, if you've looked carefully at a touch controller, you'll realize the left-hand side of the touch controller has the XY buttons right next to the touch controller. And the, the deal here is that, you know, that is relatively different from how the gamepad is mapped, such that if your application needed the user to hit one of those buttons as well as using the touch controller, there's a good chance that won't work for your application, so you'll need to think around that. To test this locally, you simply add this registry key, and the value you set the registry key to is one of these three options. And I will now go into the three options. So the most obvious one is the twin stick mode, where basically the left stick is mapped as usual and the right stick is mapped as usual as well. The menu button and the triggers are always mapped the same way because uh, they are provided as is. The next mode is the left D-pad mode, where instead of mapping the left stick to the left thumb stick on the gamepad, now we're mapping it to the uh, D-pad, and the click of it is mapped to the View button. And last but not least, we have the right stick on the right D-pad mode. The right stick maps to the D-pad, and similarly, the click ma maps to the View. So that's all we have to share with you. But before we open it up for Q&A, uh, I did want to point out that at 3 PM, there is a Making Mixed Reality Capture talk. These guys have worked tirelessly, and they've done some really awesome work. If, your application, if you're looking at utilizing any of the mixed reality capture options, they've made some extensive changes and updates to our SDK as well. We didn't want to rehash the work they've done, so I would highly recommend that you guys go and uh, check those guys out. Thank you, and questions?